Good morning, everybody. My name is Michael Jalner, international editor with the Danish newspaper Politiken. Uh, and I have the honor to moderate the session uh, entitled Strategic Outlook for Europe. I also have the honor to welcome a powerful panel consisting of uh, Kersti Kaljulaid, president of Estonia since 2016, first female president in Estonia and youngest ever. Yong Deng, vice president and dean at China Europe International Business School in Shanghai, one of the most quoted experts in mainland China when it comes to economics. Mr. Valdis Dombrovskis, Vice President of the EU Commission for Euro and Social Dialogue, and also pre former uh, Prime Minister of uh, Latvia from 2009 until 2014. And Jules Chappell, Managing Director for Business at London Partners, lead teams that support investors in London and help London-based companies to export. Welcome to all of you. A few years ago, I was moderating with CNN's uh, Money's famous host, uh, Richard Quest, and he was talking about interesting times. <laughs> I'm not able to pronounce interesting times as intensely as, as uh, Richard Quest can do, but I can assure you that when we were talking, it was interesting times, but now they are even more interesting. Global powers are shifting. All powers changes course. USA is behaving in a more unpredictable way, but around an axis of America first and a sort of contempt for inst international institutions like uh, WTO, treaties and agreements, a sort of a deal based bilateralism. And now an ongoing trade war with China is taking more and more power. China is the upcoming superpower, soon with the world's next largest economy and ambitious plans like the Belt and Road Initiative and Made in China 2025. EU in the middle stands there, another economic giant with large ambitions but also almost imploding forces like Brexit, EU skepticism and political polarization between countries and inside countries. Today we will have two questions to answer. With a combined GDP of 15.3 trillion euro, the EU is the second largest economy, but political tensions between its member states with the USA and Brexit are putting it to the test. What are the implications for business? What are the implications for Europe's standing in a world between USA and China? You might have other questions out there and uh, you will be able to, to answer or, or to pose them uh, later in the session. We'll come back to, to that. But first, President Kajulaid, how do you assess EU's power in, in this dramatic situation in, in the world as it is by now? Uh, frankly speaking, I think um all these risks uh, and uh, problems you mentioned in the EU context, I admit uh, Brexit is a sad event and uh, creates a lose-lose situation uh, on both sides and uh, we have nothing else to do but to respect the uh, democratic decision of British people but economically looking uh, it doesn't shape out too good also I think politically looking it's not looking good but uh, that apart uh, if you say there is discussion in the EU and, and therefore EU might be somehow weaker in its international position, then I think you are mistaken. Because uh, if you consider the discussions we have to have, for example, migration, terrorism, uh, these will not be solved better alone. As our uh, British uh, friends quip nowadays, it's thank God the rest 27 are sticking together. Imagine trying to negotiate to each one alone. And let's take one concrete example, migration. We don't have a European Union and we need to agree on how to quell the migration or how to uh, accept migrants in an orderly way on our continent. We take how many years to find a place where we do this Congress of Migration of Europe? How many years to set the scene? And how many years to agree on the rules? And then there will be not be implementing body. I mean, it's simple 
economical logic, not rule of law, but simple logic of economy, efficiency and effectiveness, which are the three catch lines of the European Commission always, that we do these things together. And yes, we do argue among ourselves, but it happens in a preset format. We have already rules when we enter this big egg building, or used to slip us previously, and we argue within this framework, and we come to conclusions within this framework. And if it looks nasty to outsiders or to journalists, it's because it's transparent. But the process is continuous, and nobody has yet proposed anything which will be more economical, efficient, uh, and basically useful for European people. But try to do it one by one, everything one by one. I don't need, know where you arrive. Try to look at every European economy alone. I mean, Frank-Walter Steinmeier says very often, very openly, Germany is too small to go with alone. 500 million relatively rich customers. This already sounds the bell. We biggest economies like uh, this one surrounding us. But still you have those forces about nationalism, about increasing Euroscepticism and even a Brexit. There, uh, I believe, has been uh, a few things which you could always say we have also done wrong. One thing which I think uh, it went wrong sometime between Barroso 1 and 2, it was this Europe is coming close to simple people. I'm sorry, Europe is a difficult legal construct meant for one thing. Leaders, democratically elected leaders, come together and argue it out, what is best for everybody. And this is what the European Union is. It's not coming close to every people. It's not taking social responsibility. Redistributional policies from education, starting from education, which is very important, egalitarian education. This is member states' responsibility. So the popularity of Brussels will always be actually held hostage by how well member states' government use this forum in Brussels and use these gains, economic gains, they get from belonging to this huge market. And there are gains, only Greece is behind its 2004 wealth level. Everybody else is richer, including the Western, uh, Western uh, uh, European countries. And these gains need to be used for these, in white term, redistributional policies. If this goes wrong, nothing can save the popularity of Brussels. And my feeling is, is there egalitarian education available, for example, in UK? In Estonia it is. Well, of course it may be false correlation, but in our country the popularity of EU is 79%, and don't give me this, you get so much money from there. Mr. Yang Deng, yeah. that was uh, the president's uh, perspective on it. How does it look from, from, from China, and how does, does, does the, the view uh, affect uh, business, actually? Okay, so uh, I'm someone maybe a little bit atypical because I lived in France for 12 years, so I also look from the inside, and now I'm living in China and dialoguing with uh, different level of people, different uh, uh, social classes, if, we have, if we are, I'm allowed to say that. So first I see there are several issues we have to face. Uh, the first one is really about immigration in, in Europe because the, for me the biggest problem we see now is the confusion between economic immigrants and the refugees because in all the European countries we are still mixing these two, two words. Uh, last year, uh, WEF uh, invited me with a bunch of uh, experts. We work very hard in Milan to come out with some white papers, but I don't see anything uh, really catch any intention in, in Brussels talking about how to create a rational immigration system, economic driven, which is necessary for the aging population, and to fix some uh, structure to accept uh, with, within the capacity these are. Uh, political refugees, but still the problem is not solved. And another big issue we saw, all the crisis started with a very aggressive or ambitious in enlargement of EU, and that of course creates a lot of heterogeneity within the group. And now we are always questioning, I'm an outsider, so I can always question. So EU is about uh, integration of value or integration of ge geopolitical zone. So, Nobody really answered me in a, in a satisfactory way, so sorry to be blunt. The third one is also about the talk, because I'm sitting in, in, in France in an ordinary family watching the TV when the politicians are talking about Brussels and EU, and every time when they go to Brussels, agree on some uh, coordinated reform or, or integration, when they go back home, when they sell it, to their voters, they always try to blame Brussels. That I'm sorry, but we are in that system, and we have to implement that because it's come from Brussels. At the end of the day, the ordinary people say, 
why shouldn't we get out, get out of it? So that's why we have the breakers. So the politicians, although the majority of them in power, they are pro-Europe, uh, but they are still using uh, Brussels to, to just discharge their responsibility or to rec recognize the, 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 the reality. From China, I see there's a lot of problems. Of course, China has a lot of problems. The Chinese investors in Europe, uh, they have a lot of problems. We, we, can, we can talk for hours about that. I'm, I did a lot of study on that. But there are two issues. I think for China now, it's a very risky moment to enter into Europe. First of all, by investing one country against another, that will make the divergence within the European Union more visible. And the Europeans might use China, the, some European countries, to play against Brussels. And actually, this will intensify the, 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 the conflicts within the, uh, the, the, among the, the different uh, mem uh, member states. The second problem is with the, the, the increase of the nationalism and the protectionism, as, uh, uh, as uh, Mike mentioned at the beginning. Uh, I see more and more resistance uh, among the very investment-friendly countries like Germany even, if it's not in EU, like Switzerland, France, against the Chinese investment. But actually, it's a reflection of the internal problem within EU. So I just stop here. No, but, but, but could yeah. you please elaborate when you said that some countries are using yeah. China against yeah. Brussels. Yeah. So, so you have a feeling that, that uh, countries are not it's not like China and EU, but this is something which is used internally in EU yeah. to... Yeah, yeah, I agree. Because the, the problem is that if you look at many of these uh, uh, Eastern European countries, they have a high uh, aspiration for the, support, for the support from uh, uh, Brussels. And Brussels, and now they are playing between Brussels and China, because you, you know in China they have this structure called the 16 plus 1. So there are a lot of uh, investment pulling into uh, these re areas, maybe using different, uh, because the, the value system different, different kind of uh, regulation or approval. Then that creates more problem. Actually, for me, the problem, first the problem is internal. But now with the Chinese investment coming into this area of the uh, European Union, actually that in intensified the, the, the divergence and the problem. I have a, sorry, I have a two things on that. I come from that part of Europe, yeah. and I have strongly targeted, first of all, all EU countries apply EU procurement rules yeah. in public pro, uh, processes. Also, there is a level playing field for all kinds of capital, so it's absolutely impossible under the European structure to play one country, one country's capital against somebody else's least European MFF. It's a ridiculous notion. Another ridiculous notion is that all problems in Europe started in with enlargement. We didn't, sorry to say, unleash Lehman Bros. We absolutely didn't unleash the migration crisis. And we didn't leave the uh, uh, liberal reforms undone in Italy and France like they were done in Germany. So we didn't kill the economic growth. What we did, we made Europe more competitive actually by holding back the uh, growth of the average salaries or lower, or lower end salaries in Western uh, economies. And this was done in two different means. And one of them, I admit, may have led to Brexit. Because if you see, now we can look back, it's inside, so you couldn't know what happens. But UK opened its job market immediately, whereas Germany and France didn't. Mm -hmm. Now, if we look 15 years on, UK has many immigrants, but uh, relatively little factories in Eastern Europe, whereas French and German businesses were forced to go out now they are all in already in Serbia and building factories there because it's again cheaper. We have converged. We are not competitive in that sector anymore. But this quelled salaries, but didn't raise the migration question to the level in France and Germany, even if the macro effect was the same. So you could see there were different outcomes. But otherwise, I, I really refuse to accept that um, Europe's problem is that it has Eastern European members. Yes, that is the free, free seas initiative, but this is all under the European Union procurement rules. I mean, this is just ridiculous. I'm sorry if uh, people in France think this okay. way. I understand this is a le petit peuple de français qui uh, pense comme ça. Okay. Okay. We take it in all languages. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> George um a disorderly Brexit could have dire consequences for you, UK uh, warns uh, IMF and Christine Lagarde. Business must be freezing somehow in, in UK right now. I, I think it's true to say that 
the uncertainty has been unhelpful for businesses, honestly, across all borders, um, and particularly in regulated, very heavily regulated industries. We've certainly seen the contingency planning already happening. Um, but, I, but I did actually, I checked the, um, the FT data on, on FDI, particularly into London, uh, over the past year before coming mm -hmm. to this conference, and latest stats are sort of July to July. And London um, has the fundamentals of being a very international trading city. I mean, a history of 2,000 years of being very adaptable, very resilient. And it remains, out of 11,500 cities um, monitored in terms of FDI projects, it remains the single biggest destination for FDI projects, both in terms of coming in from around the world, but also going out. And I think it's important to keep that in perspective, because... <laughs> That international trading is part of the DNA of a city like London. It's an incredibly diverse city. You know, every third Londoner comes from outside of the UK. It has more international bank lending than any other city in the world, largest foreign exchange, second largest assets under management, fourth largest insurance market, you know, very world leading in terms of infrastructure, finance, which is important for initiatives like the Belt and Road, sustainable finance, fintech as well as the wider technology infrastructure. And I think what, while this is undoubtedly, as you started, challenging times, I was quite, quite struck listening to the president, because I, I used to be a British ambassador, and we used to cooperate so closely because of the values that we shared. It wasn't because in the morning we got a script from the commission saying this is your, this, these are your lines to take. We operated as a group because we genuinely agreed with each other. Exactly. And, I am very pragmatic in, in hoping that despite these challenges, that we are a very, we're a group of friends. And I, you know, I listen to you and I find myself nodding. And <laughs> I don't think that's going to change after Brexit. But I do think that there are real tensions. And I mean, we're sat here in the World Economic Forum. And I, I think when we talk about the fourth industrial revolution and the pace and the scale of change, it is incredibly difficult for humans, for cities, to adapt at the pace that we need to adapt. And we need to be incredibly resilient, more so now than perhaps ever before. And so I think that whilst politics is undoubtedly difficult, I, do, I, I get very different feelings when I am sat with a group of tech entrepreneurs in London. I feel the sense of international collaboration, and a lot of it purpose-driven and driven by these big global challenges and that longer-term perspective. So that is what gives me ongoing hope. <laughs> but that takes me directly to Mr. Dembrovskis, because do you have the same optimistic perspective uh, on the world? When facing maybe a hard Brexit, uh, we have seen uh, the French government are even, is even uh, driving up some uh, contingency plans for, for, for the future. How does it look for, from your, from your uh, post? Uh, well, first of all, look at the economic outlook of uh, uh, Europe. Uh, actually, it looks uh, quite uh, stable, so we expect around 2% uh, growth uh, both uh, this year and uh, next. Uh, our estimates on the impact of Brexit so far, the effect or economic growth has been uh, quite limited for EU27. It has been uh, more pronounced for uh, UK because currently UK together with Italy are slowest growing EU uh, economies. Uh, but uh, in any case, we see that the economic growth is set to continue uh, despite the uh, Brexit and uh, uh, approaching Brexit uh, deadline. Then if we talk about public perception uh, of uh, EU, uh, 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 actually, uh, the latest uh, uh, data shows that uh, two-thirds of Europeans think that European Union is good for their countries. And that's the highest share since 1983. So, uh, uh, in a sense, one could say that the difficulties which are uh, facing, would it be uh, Brexit, would it be uh, instability and conflicts in our neighborhoods, both eastern and southern neighborhood, would it be uh, ongoing uh, trade uh, tensions, are actually concentrating minds and uh, 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 more Europeans understand that we are better off dealing with the problems together than trying to solve them in 28 uh, different ways. But when, when you are meeting your counterparts here in Beijing, as I know you, you are, what is the perception right now of, of EU? How does Chinese officials look at, at EU's ability to, to, to play a powerful uh, role internationally? Well, uh, actually, now we uh, see that the perceptions of EU are, uh, uh, I would say, 
uh, positive and we see increased interest. Maybe exactly for the reasons that the uh, US uh, has decided to engage in uh, extensive uh, trade uh, conflicts, escalating uh, tariffs, and so on and so forth. We actually see that there is a lot of interest to cooperate with the EU, and also from EU side, I think uh, 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 there is uh, uh, some areas where we can step up our also external economic activity, including by strengthening the international role of the euro. It's, it would be unnatural not to touch on, on the trade war, uh, which is blooming. I mean, uh, you both had meetings with uh, the Chinese uh, leadership and, and leading officials while USA was pronoun pronouncing new uh, tariffs. China was uh, answering back again. What do you fear the most from this situation, situation we are standing in, in the relation between China, USA, and EU? Well, uh, first, uh, if uh, we uh, clearly see those uh, uh, trade uh, tensions as a downside economic risk, uh, maybe we do not see it like immediately uh, uh, triggering in the global and uh, potentially European economy, uh, but we already see it in a confidence indicators, which then leads to the investment decisions, potentially consumption. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, clearly, that kind of a, a, a retreat to protectionism. Uh, can be damaging to the world economy. But then I would say there is another worry, which is uh, uh, to protect the multilateral rules-based system. And that's why EU is emphasizing so much the need to respect the role of international organizations, including World Trade Organization. Uh, as you know, just yesterday, EU European Commission came uh, uh, up with some new uh, ideas on how to facilitate the WTO uh, reform. So we think that it's important that we solve our trade tensions, which inevitably occur within existing international framework. So it would be like trying to, to pop up uh, the, the VTO. But what would we do? How can we put an American president on board? I mean, what can EU do to put an American president on board? You're I laughing, Mr. Pre no, Mr. President. We need to kick the can down the road unless, uh, until it becomes apparent what happens to the economy. But Baltis may have a better idea because well, they, are, they are in the business of kicking the can down the road. Course, so. <laughs> well, uh, actually, uh, if we talk exactly trade tensions and President uh, Trump, we are in a business of stopping uh, the escalation. Uh, as you remember, uh, there was a, a meeting between uh, President Trump and President of European Commission, Mr. Juncker, which avoided further trade conflict escalation between EU and US. And uh, indeed, uh, we agreed to set up a negotiating group, and currently we are sitting at the table and negotiating trade with the US. Well, uh, the scope of negotiations is clearly less ambitious than what we were uh, discussing when we were uh, negotiating TTIP, Transatlantic Trade and Investment uh, Partnership. But I would say in the current circumstances, the very fact that we are actually sitting at the table and negotiating is already a good sign. When you are running down international papers, you often see there's a fear among some Chinese uh, diplomats that uh, EU and USA is actually going on the same boat, boat yeah. that uh, Trump, Donald Trump is actually trying to take EU into, out of the equation, put him on, on their side. Uh, so EU and, and USA would, would uh, actually end up teaming up against uh, China in, in a WTO. What is your perspective on that? I think the, this is the, the worst uh, nightmare that the Chinese authorities are thinking about, uh, waiting uh, currently. But there is some way out. Uh, first of all, as uh, uh, Mr. Commissioner mentioned very well, that uh, the approach that uh, President uh, Trump adopted is more like a unilateral, so one-to-one -one negotiation, which was totally against the, uh, the, the, the value that the, the, the European Union and China want to protect, which was under the, the international setting of uh, multilateralism. And so this is, I think, a window of opportunity for both sides to sit down and, and talk. And I think on, on the other side, uh, there's, uh, for the China, there's opportunity to really uh, work well with other parts of the world to deepen the reform, which is also a commitment 
from President Xi Jinping, and we will hear from Premier Li Keqiang very soon, just in an hour. I'm sure that they will reconfirm this kind of uh, direction for China. On the other side, uh, for the European Union, China is by far the, the biggest opportunity for the next uh, one or two decades to grow. I just want to share some of the numbers. Uh, this year, according to the Economist, China will become the largest consumption market in the world with 5.7 trillion US dollars. And uh, with the growth of 7% uh, 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 per year, uh, in two years, the Chinese market will at least twice larger than the U US market, which will be the second largest consumption market. So for the European side, since we have so many good products and service and brands, so China represents a, a big a growth opportunity for European companies. And yesterday I was uh, joining some other panels and there is a very interesting insight shared by some Chinese companies uh, showing that because of the, the increasing level of protection of uh, intellectual property in China and also the, the, the higher level of protection for the environmental uh, issues and it's also becoming the KPIs of the local authorities. A lot of the small and the highly polluting factories are closing down. I talked with some leading uh, chemical companies from Europe for the, for the first uh, six months of this year they enjoy more than 70% increase of sales and profit in China. So there are some great opportunities uh, for the, the European multinationals so we keep, we try to keep positive and, and negotiate. I think this is the best way to, to get a kind of win-win solution for both sides. President, uh, President uh, Light, you touched upon it. How, how good friends are we uh, after all, China and, and EU? We are seeing a tendency we saw in Germany recently was uh, avoiding a Chinese investment in, in a company for security reasons. Uh, we have seen friends doing the same. How do you assess uh, the... First, first of all, I think you take it uh, from the wrong viewpoint. It's not about being friends. It's about creating win-win situations economically and politically for us all. Second, you mentioned the stream the, uh, in the newspapers that there is a certain fear that uh, US and EU will team up. Well, I can bring you enough examples of the different stream in equally good newspapers which say Europe is turning anti-America. Very, very much also uh, forward. It's so, I mean, let's all, everybody calm down. We have our economic interests, we have our interests to protect our people, and we need to work these through. Europe values cooperation through the World Trade Organization. Europe values also the rule-based world order. It's, it's uh, deeply uh, written into our basic values that uh, without that, Europe cannot survive, so that enough win-win situations will be created, because interest-based means win-lose, and we know that wouldn't work for us. And therefore, what we are trying to do is to discuss with Chinese how our companies could be, for example, sure that their intellectual property is protected when they do work here. Discuss with um, Chinese how they, with all other, well, capital providers, can find equal conditions to their capital in Europe. And with US, uh, I think, uh, Waldis Dombrovski has elegantly put how they say in Europe if they are kicking the can down the road. This is all what he said. We have created a negotiating group. This has split into, into thematic negotiating groups. We take two or three years. Meanwhile, sanctions are not getting applied. Mm. And just the risk of getting them applied will start to change supply chains, which will bring economic calamities. And therefore, as we know, and which has happened before with the steel tariffs of Bush area, this whole thing will peter out, if we are lucky and smart. If we do not have strategic patience, of course, and react very quickly, and I admit that nowadays all this um, social media and everything seeks uh, instant gratification in politics. But I mean, this is not about instant gratification. This is taking things calmly forward. And I also wanted to say to Ms. Chappell that you very elegantly put it uh, <laughs> that actually UK is not leaving Europe, it's leaving European Union. And the other streams of our cooperation actually really strong and good, definitely not affected by this process. Because it's very common to think that now they will be very uh, mean about how they do other things, like, for example, defense cooperation, where we two cooperate very closely. And we have been warned that you will see, you will be forced to take that side in this Brexit discussion, because otherwise you will be punished in other streams. Not a single incident, not a single hint that this could happen over two years. And I applaud the UK politicians for that. Thank you. George Chappell, 
I, I would like to take the same question to you because the English government took the same sta stance as the German and France and recently uh, propped up the possibilities that the government could actually uh, stop uh, Chinese investment in, I think they called it, sensitive industries. Um, how do you assess the, not the friendship then, but the partnership? Well, I, I mean, speaking from London, um, China and the US are the two biggest investors into London. So both um, very established relationships, both incredibly important relationships. Um, there is obviously a process in terms of assessing investments. And, and again, it comes back, so many of these standards and points of view are completely shared. And so from... Um, from that cooperation point of view, and as you say, it's now, you're absolutely right, not once has have those fundamentals been brought into the negotiating table because, because we share them. So it's, exactly. you know, it, it's, it's, it would be completely counterintuitive. Um, so on, on, again, I think on those kind of strategic issues, there will always be that sense of collaboration. Um, but where there is a great opportunity, I think our um, areas, particularly around uh, fintech, AI, uh, blockchain, creative technologies, where particularly um, China and London, there is already very strong activity. I mean, just yesterday, uh, or a couple of days ago, Babylon, uh, which is one of the London's unicorns, announced a new investment in AI and health, and that's done in partnership with Tencent, and Hawaii is, has, has invested a lot more as well into, into London. So I think, you know, these, these will be, I, I love the phrase strategic patience. I think where there are values shared, mm -hmm. these very, these spikes of difficult political negotiation, I think pragmatism will win through. Ms. Yang, then taking the question to you, how is it perceived in, in China? I think for, for the Chinese side, they are still in a transformation period. I think uh, the Chinese colleagues, they are repositioning themselves. Many of them are still staying in the old model by believing China is still a developing and uh, tr uh, transitional economy. But the problem now is that on the other side, China has a much bigger ambition to be in the center of the stage. Of course, if you are in the center of the stage, you have to bear the equivalent uh, responsibility. So I think what the, the message is not well taken. Actually, when they translate to Chinese, it's lost the meaning. When uh, Macau or Macron uh, come here and uh, push Chinese side to get what's, what they call the reciprocity, and Chinese understand in a, in a kind of transactional way, but actually in the, when the Europeans talking about it, it's more about equality. So I think on this side, we need to push them further. And uh, uh, by representing my school, when I travel to Europe, uh, many of the journalists are asking me a very, I would say, uh, hot or spicy question, especially for in Germany, uh, asking me that when uh, Professor Dean will, will be allowed to buy 10% of uh, number one automotive in Changchun, and the 10% of ICBC, because they already sold these 10% of Deutsche Bank and the Mercedes Benz to Chinese investors. So, I see, of course, when I repeat the same question to my Chinese colleagues here, always the first reaction is that we are different, we are a transactional economy, we are still emerging, so how come we can sell these strategic assets? But I said, are these strategic assets for Germans? So, so Gradually, they will realize that, and I think it's everybody's interest to really open equally. I think the, the European Chamber of Commerce here, the German Chamber of Commerce, here, they are working very hard pushing that. And also, uh, recently I had a talk with, uh, with MOFCOM people, and uh, they also raised the same question. They, they said, why the multinationals now are here, they are asking for more? I said. The, the, the perceptions of these uh, multinationals are very different. When they came to China early 1980s, even uh, till uh, 1990s, they came here to take China as a stop of manufacturing for their global value chain. So they don't care actually that much about this uh, corporate uh, environment for, for them because they're just here to take all the raw materials and components out of China, do the processing and resell it in the world. So they only care about tax, the land price, the labor, that's it. But now many of the multinationals, when I talk with them, they want to come to China to stay. They say, okay, we are now want to become a true uh, corporate uh, citizen in China. So we will create the whole value chain in China, from the branding, from R&D, some specific products to the Chinese market. So of course, they are much more sensitive towards the Chinese legal, taxation, and even uh, uh, environmental and uh, 
and, and, and uh, uh, IP protection environment. So they are much more sensitive about that. So Chinese uh, colleagues, they still need some time to digest all that. But I, I hope that will come very soon. It's good for the, uh, the multinational, for Europeans, but it's also very good for the Chinese economy. And Mr. Dombrovsky, I noticed that you in an interview yesterday, you actually said some of the same, that now it was time for China to deliver on trade, for example. Could you elaborate on that? Well, uh, actually, uh, uh, we were discussing the uh, Chinese market uh, opening. Uh, uh, I did both bilaterally uh, during my uh, visit to Beijing. Uh, also yesterday, there was a dedicated panel on this. Uh, so uh, on this, uh, uh, China has recently come up with a new uh, initiatives on uh, market opening, and from the EU side, we very much uh, welcome those uh, initiatives uh, uh, and. Uh, 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 especially in the area of financial services, we see that it's actually quite broad-based market uh, opening, covering banking, insurance, capital markets, uh, credit rating, so number of uh, areas uh, uh, that the, um, uh, so to say, ownership share caps will be uh, li uh, raised or even lifted altogether. So uh, we uh, uh, certainly welcome this uh, ambition. So what will matter now is the implementation. So how it's practically implemented at central level, at local level, uh, how it's seen from the real business perspective. Do they really see the hurdles to the investment being uh, uh, removed? So uh, uh, we uh, welcome this policy announcement and uh, 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 are uh, uh, willing to see a timely and full implementation. And, and what are the time prospects in this? Well, as regards the time uh, uh, prospects, uh, that's uh, exactly the question. So the policy announcements are there. That the, the decisions will start actually triggering down already. Some have already. Uh, started so uh, 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 as I said now it will be uh, what will matter is more to see the uh, practical implementation of those uh, decisions and, and what will uh, you come with uh, the other way around well uh, uh, as you know we are also now in a process of negotiating between EU and China a comprehensive uh, uh, investment agreement uh, there was a 20th EU-China summit in July where we made uh, some uh, progress as regards the investment uh, agreement and we hope uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to make progress and to reach this uh, agreement uh, which we believe is mutually beneficial for both EU and uh, China as it will provide more clarity for both sides So, what are the rules of game on uh, investing in each other's uh, economy. Do, do all of you, do you sense that the ongoing trade war with USA, has that somehow made China more open for, for, for this uh, European uh, point of view? Any? It was interesting. I was, I was at a lunch yesterday and there uh, was an investor, a Chinese investor in Silicon Valley, and saying that they were feeling the impact of these tensions and that some investors were now looking to European markets potentially to, to put their capital there. So I, I think, I mean, uh, as a, as a Brit, I, I love rules. <laughs> you know, we very much follow the rules-based um, system. So, I, you know, I don't think anyone wants to see these kind of trade wars. But I think there, there are opportunities for Europe. Well, I, frankly, I think uh, these things rather coincide. Chinese economy has grown uh, quite quickly, so big. But first of all, of course, it is able to, uh, I mean, trade with most of us, all of us, uh, more and more extensively. Second, it's also creating capital for foreign investment. So it's just uh, two things coinciding that we do see. We would have seen this anyway. We have been talking for 10 years now that uh, China is coming out. On the other hand, we, of course, have to remember that, I mean, uh, in, the, in this economic room, there exist different rules. We are liberal market economies. Uh, this is a rather state-controlled, uh, I admit, uh, at the SME level, quite similar to what we do. But if we get to larger companies, it's not exactly the same. And so these two economic spaces, if they do coexist side by side, they need uh, different multilateral fora 
in order to understand each other well and to operate well, not seamlessly together, but at least understanding why there are differences. And, and if there are differences, then at crossing these borders, these differences need to be evened out somehow. And for that, we need to continue these discussions. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I do welcome uh, one huge country with really huge population uh, exiting in uh, big swaths of its population poverty. We have also created in 30 years uh, an economic change in mm. Estonia in 91. We think our average salary, we think we cannot even measure, it was about $30, now it's 1,300. We are also coming out, we are also starting to look where to invest because you cannot anymore construct stuff in Estonia. You have to go somewhere where, where it is cheaper and, and concentrate on, uh, on growing not your GDP but your gross national product. Same happens here, just I mean in a billion times larger, larger scale. This is the difference. But otherwise, it's exactly what you would expect for a country which passes the transformative phase to uh, start acting. We do the same. It's just that we are 1.3 million and the smallest economy I mean, in the, in, among Nordic countries. Otherwise, it's just economic logic. Okay. Uh, for me, uh, if we want to make sure that uh, investment flow uh, works well, there are two issues. Uh, of course, as, as I mentioned, uh, if we look at the, 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 the Euro, Europe, Europe vs. US, there are a lot of uh, substitution effect in the, in the technology uh, partnership for China. So, of course, naturally, with all the resistance that they are facing uh, in US, many of the Chinese uh, companies and investors will move into Europe, and it's happening already. However, in order to make it uh, work, we need to to observe the two level issues. The one level is like uh, Madam the President mentioned about this uh, uh, nation level, how China will uh, reform its system in order to, uh, to, to, to offer a more friend friendly environment for investment in China. So of course we are pushing on the trade, but also another side is the investment. So this is something that Chinese company cannot work on, but they will suffer or they will benefit from that. Because if not, the, the, the host countries in Europe will take that as a hostage in order to push China towards that direction. But and th then, since I'm a business school professor, there is also a clearly a firm level uh, operation issues because how to make Chinese investment smooth and profitable for both countries, this is also a big issue and big challenge. Because we see many failures in the past five years. Some of them are hit in the headlines in Europe, which creates some very bad uh, reputation damage for, for Chinese companies. So then the, the local environment will resist Chinese investment because of these failures. And the, the politicians with the elections, they have to face that because of their accountability and they have to do something, again, unfortunately, against the Chinese investment. So there is a nation level and also firm level. So it's uh, the responsibility on both levels to, to, to work together and in order to push that into a smooth way. In May, uh, trade ministers of uh, EU, Japan and US uh, actually agreed to deepen and accelerate discussions uh, to regarding possible new rules on industry subsidies and state-owned enterprises so as to promote a more uh, level playing field. I guess that is still going on and that, that, could, that could indicate that, that we are actually seeing an, an, a new front, EU, Japan, uh, USA front in, in WTO to strengthen the rules. Well, uh, there, I would say there are um, uh, 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 several aspects. Uh, if we discuss uh, those uh, uh, points which you raised on uh, subsidies, I would also add intellectual uh, property rights, uh, technology transfers. Those are not uh, new uh, issues. Uh, and those had been issues we had been uh, raising with uh, China bilaterally. We had been raising uh, it uh, within the framework of WTO. Uh, those are the issues which we now propose uh, also to uh, deal with when discussing WTO uh, reforms. So uh, 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 clearly those uh, are the issues which we are raising. But what we are saying here is that exactly we need to solve those uh, differences, those disputes through the international uh, organizations, through the World Trade Organization. 
And that's why we uh, do not agree to this uh, unilateral approach US is currently taking, but rather saying let's stick with the agreed uh, framework and with a multi uh, uh, multilateral way of uh, solving problems. So that was that is really what is, what is combining EU and China that is we should strengthen the WTO and the rule based system and work <clears throat> with that. That is the main objective uh, as it is right now. <coughs> so there's something which you really missed in that state statement. Combining EU and China to strengthen the WTO. I mean, multilateralism about not, is not about big ones coming together and defining. It's about everybody belonging to that organization having a, a say. And this is what matters to me always the most to remember that in multilateral processes, we have the right and say for the smaller participants. So if you define it this way, it hurts my ear. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but then I will try not to, <laughs> to hurt your ear. Because <laughs> what do we do with an American president who, who obviously do not believe so much in, in this institution? Yeah. As I said, we need to uh, delay processes as long as we can because I, I believe that even the threat of the sanctions or the threat of the breakdown of international supply chains will start, uh, well, companies in America, for example, looking for local provisions which will uh, definitely be costlier than using the current uh, model. And then hopefully, I mean, just the poor economic effect will make it once again quite clear that uh, uh, economy has not changed. It's, it's almost the rule of law that, I mean, if you cut down on international trade, you get the negative spiral. So I'm counting on our cap capability and ability to uh, draw out the process until it is quite visible that it doesn't make sense. And as you know, in the, in the uh, international politics, including trade politics, delay is one, sometimes a really good tactic. If it's possible, you move ahead quickly. If it's not possible, you do. And we have to respect that. President Trump promised his voters some things. He's now executing them. He didn't promise the macroeconomic effects which will come out of them. But when these come, his voters may also well change the view and start demanding the opposite. It's very much like in Europe. In Euro crisis, do you think that European technicians didn't know that Euro area is not complete? They did know. But when they created the Euro area, they couldn't demonstrate it to wider public. As soon as the crisis hit, it was evident to everybody. And we could in Europe move forward in, uh, in creating a better Euro area. You use what you can demonstrate to your people and then develop international relations, uh, European Union issues. This is how politics works. And it has always been like that. So uh, I somewhat tend to re also regret all these uh, shock and horror and doom and gloom thing that world is horrible. After all, yes, we have problems, really problems. For example, the number of people starving globally has started to rise again after long decline. So, I mean, these are problems, but simply that we argue in a heated way, and I do regret that sometimes we use strong words as well. I mean, this doesn't mean that the basics of international diplomacy and politics have in any way changed. Sounds like time is on our side. Yeah, I agree. I think we, we can keep this optimistic uh, note and uh, and try to move on, but uh, as you know, that there are a lot of challenges uh, down the road. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. George Chapel. Yeah. I'm just wishing I was Estonian. I can vote for. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, I, I do. It, it's actually genuinely really refreshing. Um, you know, I, I think it is very easy sometimes when you are reading the press to yeah. to feel that things are very very extreme. But as I say, I mean, I'm dealing every day with with businesses, with startups, with scale-ups, with investors, um, with regulators, with institutions like the London Stock Exchange. And, and you know, there, there is that perspective. There is that perspective of, I mean, the uncertainty is unhelpful and people just want to know, but they want to know so they can get on with it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I do think, as I say, it's genuinely very refreshing to, to hear a debate where, where that sense of perspective is so, is so concrete. I mean, in Germany, what we do here is called housewifish policy making. So we all, <laughs> we all housewives. <laughs> okay, with that word, uh, shouldn't we uh, leave the word to, to the floor? Uh, please raise your hand, any of you who has a question to the panel over here. Please, you'll have a microphone and please present yourself. And, uh, and you're welcome to indicate around, so I will take names. My name is Kumar, K.S. Kumar, <clears throat> but we have an operation in Estonia. We employ about 200 people. And uh, the question was, 
uh, to uh, President uh, of Estonia. Uh, one of the initiatives that uh, Estonia has been leading was about the uh, digitization of European Union, uh, the digital Europe. You know, in other words, to even today there are challenges about e-Europe uh, and, and therefore European Union probably has challenges about e-governance across all of the European uh, countries together. So I just wanted to get uh, you know, your view, view on how uh, you are leading the the, the, the way in, in making e-Europe actually a reality, mm. especially in the new context of the data privacy acts and so on and so forth. Yes, indeed, it is true that Estonia is a society where uh, all public service part two is operated online. That is, you cannot get married and you cannot sell property. Everything else is online, 100%. And that, of course, means that for a small open economy within the European economic space, our problems start when you want to cross border. And, of course, 80% of our business crosses border because, I mean, we are international. And, and then we in immediately have to do everything on paper and our people are seriously complaining. So when it was the EU Council presidency period for Estonia, we realized we need to do something about it. And we had a huge digital summit, which uh, I think as the most important conclusion was not which working groups and paperwork we will do thereafter, but the understanding that all leaders of Europe came together and admitted that our people are in the internet, our businesses are in the internet. They transact and interact in the internet anyway. We have to give them secure internet. We have to give people digital identities and recognize them all over Europe and, and, and start this work immediately. This understanding is clearly there. And if I'm not mistaken, France, for example, will have its digital ID uh, next year. We talk quite often with our French colleagues. Your, your, uh, your uh, Minister of Digital Affairs is practically a friend of our ambassador because very often they call and ask how you did it, and they do it. Germany gives out ID cards with digital identity since last year. So it's, it's happening. It's happening far too slowly and, and far too late to my Estonian taste. But we are able to consolidate minds on this issue. There will be a next digital summit quite soon in Tallinn where also non-EU actors will be present. So we are making this message, and this is the most important message. The governments cannot leave their people in this whole world, new world, alone. Because the biggest problem in that world is uh, the lack of identity. You blame Facebook and Google and Amazon all the time that, I mean, they did something wrong. But they give people the only digital identity, which is global. The rest isn't. So people are using it. And of course, it's been also misused because it's, it doesn't have a state guarantee. I mean, digital identity card gives you a state guaranteed internet passport. And with that, lots of problems with digital will go away. There will be a controlled part of digital where people are not anonymous. And then there will be for fun internet where you can do whatever you want, of course. And, and this is something which is the change I'm clearly seeing in Europe is right now happening. Uh, well, uh, indeed, uh, if we talk about uh, digital, uh, as you know, one of the uh, flagship uh, projects of the European Commission is a digital single market. And we are currently uh, working uh, to address exactly the issues uh, uh, President Carillo had just uh, uh, addressed uh, because uh, we uh, sense that in uh, digital we actually are not single market yet uh, also from the point of view uh, that we still uh, are fragmented among 28 uh, uh, different countries and uh, uh, Estonians or Latvians may have their e-identities. I don't even know if we recognize each other, but uh, yes, uh, clearly if you go to yes, other... E okay, that's good news. <laughs> but if you go to other EU member states, uh, you cannot use them because they are not recognized. So we indeed need to scale this up at the European level. Because indeed, if Europeans would have state or EU level guaranteed e-identities, doing business, recognizing uh, uh, people would make actually much more, it would become much more uh, uh, easy. So digital single market is uh, clearly high on our uh, priorities lists. Let's take another question. Uh, in oh, you're certainly active this morning, huh? <laughs> Question for Mr. Ding, okay. and uh, uh, it's about uh, U.S.-China trade tension. Mm. So I would like to ask uh, the scenario: if the President Don, uh, Donald Trump is continually imposing the tariffs on China, and China is also making the countermeasures, uh, what do you think the worst scenario will happen? 
uh, in your mind. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, I think in the short run, what we feel is more about uh, uh, expectation. So you already see that reflecting very well in the, in the downtrend of the capital market uh, evolution in China. And uh, then, of course, we have to do some more technical analysis. But if you look at the trade side, actually, uh, Donald Trump is taking a wrong horse. I have to admit that. Because if you look at the six months of this year, the current account of Chinese trade, including goods and services, is almost balanced, which means that China still enjoys something like a, a 150 billion US dollar surplus in goods, but there is a 140 billion, roughly, US dollar deficit in service. So that means overall, trade is not a problem anymore for China. So even U.S. admit the, the currency is not uh, undervalued uh, anymore. And if we take that out, so that means the huge surplus that China is enjoying against the U.S. is more like a routine uh, created by some of the multinationals. That means China is absorbing a lot of uh, components and uh, raw material from other countries. So they are running a deficit. And then a surplus against China. So if we take that in and also take the old story a couple of years back, and everybody knows here in China about the very low value added Chinese manufacturer created on F iPhone. So if you take all these components in, so gradually we will see there is a, a, a drop both on the importation and exportation side for China. And actually, the value added loss for Chinese exportation will be quite insignificant because most of the goods route through China with very low value added. Of course, the Chinese workers in this processing business will suffer. And many of the business, they are already moving away anyway from China because of the high cost pressure, labor, land, environmental protection, and everything. And these pressure, additional pressure, were push this Chinese company moving even more quickly. And actually, it's happening. Uh, I'm sitting on board of several Chinese companies, so the decision we're making is really to acquire companies now in Poland and the Ukraine. It's a furniture business. And then they go to Vietnam to buy some other uh, sofa or canopy factories in order to export with made in Vietnam. Uh, logo. So these things are happening. So in the, in the long run, that will disrupt and reshift the, the global supply chain uh, for sure. And, uh, but that's it. So for me, it's more psychological, it's more structural, but fundamentally the impact on the Chinese uh, uh, exportation will be quite limited, actually. This is my expectation. This actually is uh, what is going on uh, right now yeah. to continue that, that track. Uh, is that China is more and more relying on, on initiatives like uh, the Belt Road Initiative in order to change its focus and possibilities? Uh, I think for the exportation, especially for the goods we are talking about exporting to U.S., that uh, re uh, substitution effect will be quite limited. Actually, the, the main motor to, to catch up and to take off and to absorb the shock is more in the internal consumption side. Uh, uh, for the company I'm, I'm working on as a board member called Minghua Group, listed in Hong Kong, they, they are the biggest uh, uh, so far maker in the world. And actually, since two years already, uh, Chinese market is much more important than the U.S. market for the company. So uh, because of the middle class consumption, and actually the margin they, they get from the Chinese market is much higher because Chinese tend to buy the genuine leather uh, type of sofa. So the margin is much higher. So if we look into different consumption-related business, the substitution effect by the domestic market uh, uh, over this uh, exportation is huge for the past uh, two, three years. So I'm more confident on the substitution or the absorption of this shock by the internal consumption than to route that to Pakistan. Of course, they will do it, but... In a way, this is nothing new again. I mean, this has happened to all countries growing in wealth. They all start sooner or later to look somewhere else to produce yeah. and for their own capital to go outside. So again, this is nothing special with China. Yeah. It's special is the way that it is a state-controlled economy, and, uh, but nothing else is. Mr. Nabrowski. 
Well, uh, on this, maybe I would just uh, add a couple of points on the uh, Belt and Road Initiative because we had some uh, discussions about this uh, before. Because uh, later today, uh, uh, also we'll uh, publish a paper from uh, uh, European Commission side on uh, how uh, we uh, see the synergy between the Belt and Road Initiative and EU initiatives in this area, like uh, co uh, 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 connecting Europe, like Invest EU plan. Uh, because uh, clearly there can be uh, uh, synergies and uh, we will be coming with some thinking how we actually can uh, link the two to the mutual benefit. Mm -hmm. Yes, let's take it. You will have a microphone. And I saw you off. Hello. Hello. Uh, my question is to uh, President Kajulay. Uh, I represent China Finance Online. My name is Fang. I've been to Estonia. Tallinn is a beautiful, beautiful city. But I do remember my experience of trying to break a uh, 50, uh, 50 euro bill there with some small merchant. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I feel like uh, the cashless promotion is right now popular in Europe. But in terms of uh, online payment and uh, this kind of stuff, I think China is more advanced mm -hmm. uh, in every way. So uh, this experience not just included in Europe, much, much mm -hmm. of in the US, uh, they accept cash or credit cards. So mm -hmm. my, uh, my question is, what is the, like, the, the thing that uh, stops this from promoting fastly? Like, why is there no such thing like Alipay and uh, WeChat that could be making the payment mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. US and uh, Europe much mm -hmm. faster and convenient for customers? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, indeed, this is one clear example where we have fragmentations of the markets. You have your systems here and I can pay with my mobile phone in Estonia. I admit but not with my face and the PIN code, which is uh, I hear available already some places here in China. So uh, you are there in a faster development cycle than we are. These markets remain fragmented because mm. the banking markets themselves remain relatively fragmented. And there are also lots of uh, constraints set by the rules and regulations uh, in all internet business. In all internet business, we struggle with this, that our, uh, our business models are global, but our rules are local. This is exactly uh, the clearest, uh, clearest example of that. And we need to do something Science. about to make sure that our analog life applies also, uh, and it's rule book the similar way in the digital life. So in Europe, we had a long discussion whether we should even have the digital freedom, because it seems like we just apply all other four freedoms in digital, and all these also your problems would go away. Of course, not between Chinese and European companies, there is still a limitation. And big part of that is trust, also our lack of trust that our personal data will be protected, for example, if we let these systems operate in, in our, our continent. But uh, we, we soon realized that it's easier to say we will create the fifth freedom even if it actually is counterintuitive. You should simply make the four others apply in the, in the digital. Well, yeah, uh, maybe just to uh, add uh, uh, a couple of words. Uh, indeed, uh, if you look at the developments here in uh, China, on Sunday I was also visiting uh, Baidu uh, Financial Services, <coughs> FinTech uh, uh, part. Of course, it's very impressive what's, uh, what's being done uh, uh, here. Uh, then um, uh, we <coughs> have some uh, catching up to do in uh, Europe, and that's why we put forward uh, earlier this year a fintech action plan and are now looking at uh, uh, different aspects how we can facilitate fintech developments in uh, uh, Europe uh, and not only from a, a startup uh, uh, phase because if you look at the startups uh, actually Europe has very dynamic uh, startup uh, uh, landscape because well we have all it takes we have uh, good education systems, we have lots of uh, money in research and innovation, we have uh, entrepreneurial uh, spirit, so there are lots of uh, uh, startups, there is also capital available, uh, but then if you look at how those companies are scaling up, uh, actually, uh, uh, then maybe in two or five years into the business, you see much uh, less of them than you see, for example, in US. And one of the reasons why companies face difficulties of scaling up is uh, exactly what President just said: uh, is this uh, fragmentation. And that's why we are now uh, why we are now looking in. Uh, uh, fintech action plan, how we can allow fintechs to operate based on single licenses across the EU. We came with a legislative proposal, for example, for crowdfunding uh, platforms. In terms of payment services, uh, uh, I hope it will develop. We have our 
payment services uh, directive two, as we call PSD two, uh, we have uh, 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 corresponding regulatory technical uh, standards now, which uh, basically mandates EU banks to share data with payment services providers, which allow all kind of uh, then uh, fintech companies actually to uh, provide those uh, payment services. Of course, we must keep into mind that there are some additional safeguards in Europe. We take our privacy very uh, seriously. We have uh, a general data protection regulation, which needs to be followed, which puts some restrictions how you can access and use and share uh, customers' data. And you give actually more right uh, or a more control for customer itself to determine how uh, their data can be used. So there are some things which we need to bear in mind when uh, thinking of uh, developing uh, fintechs across Europe. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Hi there, um, I'm, a, I'm Scott, I live in London, um, and I wanted to ask a question kind of from the UK perspective. Um, I would maybe argue that the kind of tone in the UK right now is of complete confusion, um, and sort of hearing panels like this, um, it's kind of easy to maybe come home feeling a little bit reassured, you know, kind of saying it's you know, still got 2% growth and everything's fine, but that's certainly not how it feels on the ground for most people who are not engaged in politics, and I'm a writer myself. So do you think that the sort of confusion, hysteria, whatever is completely unfounded and we should just be all, yeah, it's fine, we'll just kind of leave it to the negotiations? Or do you think that there's, you know, a real reason to be worried and to really want to try and reverse the outcome of, of Brexit? Thank you. I, I share the, it's why I find this so refreshing is because I've come from that and I, I completely share the feeling of confusion, as I say, I think also frustration because it's been quite a long period of time. And... I think that, um, I mean, it's, it's interesting you talk about reversing. I think that Europe as a whole, when you, can't, when you come to these kind of challenges, actually you also come to appreciate things. And I was quite struck by your comments about the levels of support uh, for Europe now within Europe. And for me, that's also quite reassuring because one of the things that we will hear all the time is that UK will be beaten down. You have to show that the country will suffer for having left Europe. And actually, if there is... The reason to do that is that others don't leave. But actually, if there is increasing support for Europe, I think that is a very positive thing because actually we can all be pragmatic and continue to collaborate and innovate together without the need to feel that you have to, 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 to do something very extreme in order to keep the union together because I just don't think that is true. I think, as I say, when people are put under pressure, they appreciate things that, that perhaps they took for granted before. And I think Londoners certainly feel that, that the European Union was very much taken for granted. But actually, I do genuinely think that there is a huge amount of effort being put into um, reinforcing collaboration, innovating together. As I say, you feel that from the entrepreneurial community, that what was once taken for granted, we now need to fight for. And I think that if, it, if, I, if I have to find a silver lining, I think that is one. And then I think we'll take the last questions from over here. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Hongwei. I run a tech company in Canada. Um, most of our business is done outside of the country, traditionally with the U.S., but now increasingly with Europe uh, and China. So my question is to the Europeans on the panel. Um, I spend a lot of my time uh, trying to understand what's going to happen next from taxation and free trade with, with our southern neighbor. Um, I'm probably quite naive and ignorant when it comes to Canada's trade relations and taxation with Europe. So I was wondering if there's a good suggestion from the group as to how I can efficiently keep up. Is it The Economist or is it you know each individual country? Is it the European Union? Um, where can I efficiently get that information? Thank you. Well, uh, as regards um, um, trade, uh, as regards uh, trade, I think it's uh, in a sense uh, uh, easier because EU is acting as a trade uh, block. We are customs union and we have the same uh, trade conditions, uh, uh, so to say, with a third uh, country. So basically, wherever you enter uh, uh, the EU with your trades uh, of uh, 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 goods and services, you are uh, basically uh, uh, facing the same uh, rules in terms of uh, customs. And then it's determined by the free trade agreements which we are having with the third uh, uh, countries and uh, also with the uh, 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 WTO TO rules, with a general uh, system of preferences and so on and so forth for uh, countries with uh, whom we don't have specific uh, free trade uh, agreements. So on trade, it's relatively uh, clear. On uh, taxation, it's uh, different because there is some 
harmonization of uh, what we call indirect taxation, taxes like uh, value-added tax, like excises, like uh, uh, customs, as we already discussed. But still, there are differences in uh, member states. And uh, uh, as regards direct taxation, income taxation, personal income tax, uh, corporate income tax, social security contributions, uh, those are not uh, harmonized. So indeed, if you think about uh, taxation rules, you need to look at each uh, specific uh, member state. And if you think about doing business across Europe, indeed you need to think what are the tax uh, implications. So there the landscape is um, uh, relatively uh, complicated. Well, you can have the uh, data, uh, kind of the general data also in uh, European uh, Commission uh, website as regards uh, uh, tax rules from the EU side on the parts which are harmonized. But then you indeed need to consult mem uh, uh, information in member states regarding the taxation in each uh, member state. Okay. Frankly speaking, you don't have to set a company up in every EU country. You set up in one and you operate in everything else because tax competition is one of the few areas where we do compete and it's quite reasonable because redistributional policies are countries own, so we cannot harmonize the taxes as, as they are. On the other hand, uh, unless you are Starbucks or you have some specific deal with a, with a specific government, uh, then you are really protected in staying within this one taxation regime working in and doing trade with all others. So it's not quite so bad as it, as it may sound. <laughs> but I do admit there is competition and this is the main area where we do compete against each other because our social models differ quite a lot. Mm. Estonia doesn't have a corporate income tax, taxes only dividends, for example, but has relatively high social taxes. So I'm not advertising my country. I'm honestly saying we have high social taxes. <laughs> Some others have lower social taxes, but uh, yeah. different income tax systems. So this yeah. exists and I think uh, it's not so bad as it sounds. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid time has gone. Could I just ask the panel to shortly uh, formulate in one sentence or two maybe, what did you hope that the audience got out of this session? Should I start with Jules Chappell? Um, for me, uh, I, yeah, perspective, London is an international trading city. Um, I had one message actually for a Chinese audience re reacting to feedback that I'd got um, from people that I've spoken to. Apparently, London is seen as a very safe city, a uh, city to invest in for, for safe assets, but less one to play. And when, when I talk about playing, I mean innovating and trying out with, with really um, advanced technology. And so my, my message to a Chinese audience is, please come play in London. It's an incredibly innovative, uh, fast-paced city. Uh, you talk about um, Alipay. I just know that I need to get my other watch because everything in London is done through this. Um, but so come play in London. Come, don't just be safe. Come play. Longest sentence ever. Cuba. I'm so sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I'm a diplomat. Okay. Uh, I, I wish that uh, China and Europe can work together to maintain this uh, multilateral uh, system in the world and to make a safe and uh, fair world in the future. Thank you. Well, uh, since this um, uh, session was meant to be on a strategic outlook for uh, uh, Europe, so uh, uh, I wish the takeaway would be that uh, Europe will uh, stick together. It was very clear immediately after the British referendum that 27 countries uh, said that they see their future together. Europe's economy continues to grow. It's uh, uh, still together with US uh, largest, uh, 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 largest uh, uh, economies. And Europe remains open to trade and investment, so it's still a great uh, place to come and to do business. From this panel, I would take uh, this feeling that, I mean, we talked openly, we remain friendly, but elephants in the room, like intellectual property rights or the uh, risks for uh, personal data, these were on the table, so they were not hidden in the room. So our friendly discussion and calm discussion did not stem from the fact that we were hiding what are the differences of opinion. We do have them. And uh, globally, you would always have them. Where I see Europe, as uh, Valdis reminded, it was supposed to be about Europe. I see Europe is more and more comfortable in its common foreign policy skin as well. And it's adding the defense stream to it. And I, I can see that not despite, but mainly because we have this heated debate. When we finally decide to act at the global scene, we are more and more actually uh, coherent. And also our leaders on international scheme are, are quite coherent. And I see this is a change from maybe, uh, maybe the old times when the EU was considerably tinier. 
Thank you very much. Thank you for your marvelous contributions. Thank you for your good questions. Thank you. Thank you.